When did you first hear the term fentanyl? It, it would have been uh, in the mid 80s. There was a actual real chemist that worked for DuPont. And he was the one, the first one that actually put fentanyl together. Of course, it had been a pharmaceutical and had been uh, in research for long periods of time. But he he got into the lab and was able to get the precursors and made a batch of it. Um, and he had, because of who he was, he had no way to get it on the street. So what he did was he began a cat and mouse game with some people that turned out to be our informants. Um but there were several batches that he sold, and there was, I think there was 20 to 30 overdoses, many of them fatal, within a certain period of time. And we were eventually able to figure out who it was, and that sent shockwaves through everybody, because anybody that understood what fentanyl could do, specifically if it could be produced, was really, was awful. How can I help? How can I be useful in ending needless suffering? Do not be afraid of work that has no end. We have to organize a social movement. We have an opportunity to lead by example versus just talking hot air. I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Eventually you could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. Welcome back, everybody. Today's episode is on a subject that you likely have heard about if you live in the United States. It's the fentanyl crisis. Um, we're going to talk about it today from the perspective of a former deputy administrator of the DEA. His name is Jack Riley. He is the retired deputy administrator of the DEA, the administration's number two position. He led the manhunt team that captured the notorious Mexican cartel leader, El Chapo. He's the author of the book, Drug Warrior inside the hunt for El Chapo and the rise of America's opioid crisis. He is, without a doubt, an expert on Mexican drug cartels and the roots of the modern fentanyl crisis. He sees this issue as a national security crisis. Let's get into it. All right, so let's talk about El Chapo. Uh, Fill me in on his origin story, if you would. And I'm curious, do you remember the first time he ever hit your radar as an agent? I do. Um, and it was in, uh, it was, we had just started a, a, a new division in DEA, uh, Special Operations Division, which is now a multi-agency, longstanding centerpiece of the way that we articulate cases and make sure all the agencies bring to bear their intelligence so that we're we kind of want the, you know, the the one government way of doing things. Um, so it, it would have been probably 1991 or two um, while he was already active in Mexico and people knew who he was. At that point, we were really still concentrating on Colombia with the Medellin and Cali cartel uh, bringing them to the, their knees. So the Mexicans at that point were really uh, a loosely tied traffickers. We used to refer to them as a federation uh, because they were geographically located. They would control areas if people wanted to smuggle goods to the border, uh, they'd have to pay a tax to go through there. So they were more smugglers than narcotic traffickers at that point. And it all kind of changed. Uh, in the late 80s, when the Colombians uh, began transporting tremendous amounts of cocaine and heroin and, and uh, marijuana uh, through Mexico uh, to the United States. And the Mexicans then normally were paid in cash. In other words, you move 150 kilos of coke to L.A., we'll give you 4000 per kilo delivered to our people up there. Uh, and that whenever there's cash in business, and I know you know this, uh, bad things happen. People stick up each other or there's a lot of stuff. So the Colombians being as bright as they were, they decided to pay the uh, Mexicans with dope. So if you move 150 kilos to uh, to L.A. for us, we'll give you 40 kilos for your cost. And since the Mexican smugglers already were smuggling tremendous amounts of counterfeit stuff into the United States, you know, peppers, blue jeans, whatever they could sell on the black market, they actually had an extremely developed structure within the U.S. Uh, where their cells would operate to move these 
illegitimate uh, products. And that's where Chapo really got his education. He comes from a, a very rural part uh, of Mexico, largely agricultural, uh, but dirt, dirt poor. And he grew up around smugglers, not necessarily narcotic traffickers. So he developed a keen sense of how to move goods. Uh, you know, he, he developed a nickname we used to call him El Rapio because he could move a load of dope from Mexico into the United States within 24 hours. Uh, so he began to expand his empire using tunnels, which was the first. No one really used tunnels, although there were some early attempts to smuggle aliens through tunnels, but not for real contraband. Um, and at that point, the whole uh, cartel uh, apparatus, as we know it now, was slowly emerging um, in Mexico, um, headed by a couple of guys. Felix Gallardo was probably the number one drug lord, if you would call on the Mexican side. El Padrino was his name. Uh, he eventually went to jail uh, for being involved in the murder of Kiki Camarena, a DEA agent in 1985. Uh, if you if you recall, that was right early in my career, and uh, it, it sent the shockwave through our agency. Um, and we also showed the strength of the U.S. government because as a result of that, the Mexicans weren't cooperating in his investigation. And so we shut the border down and it it virtually killed their economy. And, you know, several days down the road, they find Kiki's body and everything else. But by El Petrino, who was kind of the godfather going to jail, Chapo um, emerged as just the most ruthless of the survivors. And he began building Sinaloa that day. You know, I, I say this frequently. Uh, Chapo, uh, he's a mass murderer of grand proportions. Don't, don't make any mistake about that. But he's one hell of a corporate C CEO. And he really used uh, his ability to organize the logistical part of the things that he was brought up in um, to develop a corporate structure, if you will, more so than any Mexican trafficker. And quite frankly, on the lines of the early Colombian cartels who were very advanced in, in the way that they put together their organization. Um, he also uh, began to exercise his violent side. Um, one of the things I always say about Chapo is he never really cared about money. It was always power for him. Hmm. So his ability to control people, um, we know at one point he had about 40 to 50 million a month going out to pay corruption and bribes within the Mexican government. Um, so he was extremely successful, really all phases of being a badass, to be honest with you. He controlled the government. He controlled the police. He instilled fear in his competition uh, and also generated a great deal of public support. Um, because he did things like build soccer fields, you know, the, the Robin Hood, you know, take from the rich, give to the poor. Yeah. So he was smart enough to really come around to see those things. And when he came on our radar, um, we had no idea the extent of his organization at that point. Uh, we were still concentrating on other things. Um, but then we began to turn our attention. Uh, we began to turn our attention to Mexico and, uh, what was his drug of choice that he was uh, pushing across the border at that time? Uh, he was really poly drug. But cocaine was his money maker uh, in terms of being able to move it and, and reap the most benefits. But their their cash crop was always marijuana, and to some extent still is today, okay. despite what people tell you. Um, and his ability to be able to move those loads across the border, marijuana's got a shelf life, so you got to be able to move pretty quick, otherwise it, it gets rotten. Um was tremendous and it, it caught us sleeping and it certainly caught the Mexicans, the ones that intended to do the right thing, sleeping too. Uh, and they went through a series of organizations. They just couldn't stop the violence. Um, so Chapo really, uh, uh, one of the most important things about organized crime in general and, and people like Chapo is this guy survived three presidential transitions in a country. That's pretty unheard of. Because usually you get a new president, the cabinet changes, the ministers change, everything changes, and you're at a loss. But this guy was so deep in everybody's pocket that he was able to stay on top for 20, 25 years. Um, and I think had he not got a little cra crazy at the end, he'd still be out there because uh, it was 
you know, we were very lucky to grab him. We really were. And then to get him extradited was unbelievable. How did you guys end up capturing him? Well, it was a series of, uh, he escaped twice. Uh, from, from There's some pretty good stories around that. Um, the first escape, he was essentially in prison because it was a safe place for him to be. Uh, in terms of his rivals, he ran his business out of there. And then when we reached the uh, Merida Accords, um, where we developed uh, extradition policy with Mexico, he decided it was time to get out of jail uh, because he would have been one, he would have been one of the first mopes we brought over here. Uh, so he walked out the front of the jail. Uh, story goes he hid in the long laundry cart, rolled out with some of his henchmen, and uh, on he went. Uh, and then we captured him about 15 years later uh, in a, a condominium based off some wire intercepts. Um, and then he was put in the maximum security prison. We were attempting to extradite. They weren't going to give him up because um, at that point, we weren't even sure we wouldn't charge him with the, you know, murder or capital crime for the death penalty. And they wouldn't do that. So, uh this is where I really get involved. Um, I had been the agent in charge of our El Paso field division. And uh, when I got put down there, um, I had about a third of the Mexican border, but it was directly across the border from Juarez. And Juarez was the real battleground. And this was in uh, what, 2005. Juarez was the real battleground. There were more people dying in Juarez than there were in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan at that point. Uh, it was crazy. And Chapo was pretty much the reason why. So what happened was I gave an interview to a newspaper, not knowing that that newspaper's sister newspaper was based in Juarez and was owned by Chapo's people. So I pretty much said, hey, I'm here. I was sent by the attorney general to kick this guy's ass and his organization and do as much damage as we can along the border so it doesn't get internal. And uh, of course, that was in the newspaper. And a couple of days later, some of the our Mexican counterparts that we trusted called and said, hey, look, uh, there's been quite a bit of chatter and they put a bounty on your head. Chop will put a head, put a bounty on my head. And, uh, you know, that was it for me. It, it, it was me or him at that point. And uh, I had so many great guys and gals down there working collaboratively. It's a tough place to work. Nobody really wants to be on the border, but we were galvanized. Um, and so I wasn't going to go anywhere. I I never told, I eventually told Washington about the threat. I didn't tell my wife for a couple of years. Um, but it was uh, it was just an exciting time. So you know, he made it personal for me. And then as I moved up through the agency, I uh, went to chief operations and the deputy administrator pretty much running the day-to-day -day stuff. It, he was it. I was, whatever I had to do, we were going to get him. So we built a whole team. Uh, it did nothing but work with our agents in Mexico, Mexico City. And the idea was to whatever we got to do to get him. Um, and so uh, he then was incarcerated. It's a funny story. So the attorney general says, look, I want you to go down and meet with the ambassador in Mexico and then meet with the head of the federal police in Mexico. You got to understand the head of the federal police at that time, that's 100,000 strong coppers. Yeah. Yeah, it's a tremendous so it's really their backbone and i met with them because we had developed some information that chapo was tunneling out uh of the prison and he had this is how stupid they were he had been in the same cell for over a year on the ground floor um so they were they were going to get him out uh and he had quite a few people that were working in the prison on the payroll including the warden so I went down and told the uh, head of the federal police who have oversight over the prisons, I said, you got to move this guy because they're going to they're going to break him out. He basically told me, hey, take it back north, gringo. You don't know what you're talking about. We got it under control. And about two weeks later, Chapo rode the motorcycle out the, <laughs> out the tunnel. <laughs> and away he went. And of course, the head of the federal police was then fired. And uh, and then it took us about two years to get him to go. But the, the way we got him, quite frankly, was the help of the Mexican Marines. And uh, we stopped worrying about him. And that was a, a decision that I made. Um, we concentrated on everybody around him, much like what they did with Osama bin Laden. Yeah. So we, we were on his doctors, his cooks, his girlfriends, his drivers, everything. And we built the pattern of life on him. Yep. 
uh, and eventually he made a couple bonehead moves at the end, moving into uh, Los Machis, where we caught him. And we saw the house being fortified. We saw everything was coming together over about a three-month period. And the Mexican Marines were wonderful. They stayed on that surveillance for about six months, which is unheard of by them because normally our counterparts in Mexico, if they start at 8 a.m., by about 10 a.m., they're going home. <laughs> so so these guys, <laughs> these guys, these guys really did what they were trained to do. And uh, we were able, one night he showed up uh, with a couple of bodyguards and the next day we uh, we went in and got him. So, and then of course my fight there was with the Department of Justice, I wanted him extradited. And that, that started a whole battle. Um, but fortunately for us, the Mexicans have been embarrassed nationally twice now the guy escaped. So they wanted him out. Yeah. So the timing, the timing was good. Um, but there was a, there was a, a series of things that went on, um, I think, that solidified the agency and also my resolve. One of the things prior to him being caught is uh, we had mounted a raid with the Mexican Marines. We felt from communication interceptions and overflights that we had him on a remote uh, area outside of Sinaloa. So we were, uh, we, we, we couldn't, we didn't want a helicopter in because they'd hear the choppers. So what we were going to do is drop the Marines and our guys in and let them ascend on foot. Had some ATVs uh, to get up there and then pre-dawn raid and hopefully we grab them. Well, we were preparing to do that. We were actually, everybody was bunkered down in a valley. And as you well know, it's not a safe place to be when everybody, you know, that's got a view on you is, is out to get you. Um, but we were told to stop. And we were told to stop because Sean Penn and uh, an act, a Mexican actress uh, were up visiting Chapo. And that just, all of those guys' life were put in jeopardy because of these two idiots. Um, and of course, we, have, we eventually hit it the next morning and he was long gone. And it was all because of them. So that began a fight with the Department of Justice. I wanted her, her and him indicted for obstruction and all this. So it, it just went, so it went nowhere. Yeah. How much of an um, impact did it have when you guys finally captured him and he was extradited? I mean, did the cartels even skip a beat when the head of the snake is cut off or do they just replace it? You, you know, they do. And they're, they're much like a military organization. There's usually someone standing in, in the way uh, to step up. Uh, if you, you know, you take the general out, somebody's going to want to yeah. uh, go up there. But what it did to them, and they're still recovering, it splintered a lot of their alliances. Um, associations began to break down. Communication wasn't as disciplined. So it gave us an opportunity and the Mexicans an opportunity, uh, both within Mexico and also domestically here within the United States, to really hit some of their organizational cells because they were undisciplined at that point. Um, they, everyone was trying to figure out who they would be allow, uh, allow, in alliance with. So we did do some damage now. Now, uh, Sinaloa right now is probably just as strong as it was then. Uh, Chapo, uh, his two idiot sons have kind of evolved to try to take it. But the real brains of the operation has always been is Miles Zimbata, uh, who to me now should be the number one wanted man in the world. He was Chapo's cohort through the early years. He's kind, he's in his 70s now. He's got diabetes. He's missing a leg. He's kind of the senior advisor, but he's the one, I think, that uh, keeps it going. And I also think he's the one that has the most influence with the Mexican government. So right. I'd like to see him locked up before I die. Where does Chapo call home these days? Oh, he's, he's, in, a, he's in a beautiful little... Well decorated cell, twenty three hours a day in uh, <laughs> Supermax, Florence, uh, in Florence, uh, Colorado, where he belongs. And uh, by all, in fact, I just got a report uh, not too long ago from some guys. He's he's now saying that he's losing his mind, and you know it's cruel and unusual punishment. I love I love every second of it. You know, <laughs> they, uh, funny story. Uh, so when he gets convicted, he's being held. The trial's in New York. He's get convicted. The judge in the Bureau of Prisons say, okay, you're going to Supermax because you're uh, obviously a threat to escape. 
So they fly him on a Marshall plane to Denver. And then the Denver field division of DEA, along with the Marshalls, transport. I mean, there's some real security concerns moving this guy. So they transport him uh, to Florence. And the only thing he said to the agents uh, on the way up there, he asked, uh, how's Jack Riley doing? No shit. Yeah. So the guy still has it out for me. So every day I, uh, I think where he is and what he's going through, it's just, you know, it's a pep in my step to, to think that we were able to do it. I mean, consider writing him a lovely uh, Christmas postcard every year, just so you know that, or that he knows that you're still thinking of him also. Yes, I, I really <laughs> should. I, I'm, I'm sure he's read the book too. So yeah. He's just gonna love that. One simple line. How's the view? Jack yeah, Riley. Yeah, yeah. How's the chow and how's the food? <laughs> Are your girlfriends making it in there? You know. Are you looking for a change agent in the energy space? Look no further. Ketone IQ is a category leader. Fuel does not need to be filled with caffeine and sugar. HVMN is changing the narrative. No sugar, no caffeine, no BS. It's just calm, clean energy on demand that improves performance and cognition. HVMN was awarded a $6 million phase two STTR by the US Special Operations Command to produce a ketone-based product that would improve performance at altitude and protect against cognitive loss in hypoxic environments. I'll be honest with you, the flavor is rough, but what's real is the energy, the sustained energy that you will get when you take Ketone IQ. Actually, probably my favorite thing about it though, beyond the energy that you get from it or in addition to the energy that you get from it, is its size. I mean, you can stuff a couple of these in your backpack. It's not bulky, it's not a full-size drink. Throw it in your bag, take one when you need it, and you're off and running with clean, sustained energy. Please go check out our partner, HVMN, the brand behind Ketone IQ, at hvmn.com slash change agents. Hit you with that one more time. Let's do it military phonetically. Hotel Victor Mike November.com slash change agents. Still got it. It's no big deal. To receive 30% off your first subscription order of Ketone IQ. Hey, everyone. Andy Stumpf here, the host of the Ironclad Original Change Agents podcast. In addition to producing podcasts like Change Agents, Danger Close with Jack Carr, Oil and Whiskey with Roadster Shop, and others, Ironclad also works with some of the world's biggest brands like Mechanics Wear, Under Armour, the Navy SEAL Foundation, Anthem, and a ton of others to create industry-leading custom film series, commercials, podcasts, and more. We can also get your message in front of an audience of millions by placing it on podcasts and series just like this one. To check out more about Ironclad and see how they can help you elevate your company, brand, or business, check out thisisironclad.com. Thisisironclad.com. Question for you, switching gears here a little bit. When did you first hear the term fentanyl? It would have been uh, in the mid eighties. We had a, uh, this is a funny story too. You think about it. There was a actual real chemist that worked for DuPont. Um, in the early eighties, he worked for DuPont and had laboratory privileges at a DuPont plant. And I believe outside of Boston. And he was the one, the first one that actually put fentanyl together. Of course, it had been a pharmaceutical and had been uh in research for long periods of time, but he he got into the lab and was able to get the precursors and made a batch of it. Um, and he had, because of who he was, he had no way to get it on the street. So what he did was he began a cat and mouse game with some people that turned out to be our informants. Um, but there were several batches that he sold and there was, I think there was 20 to 30 overdoses, many of them fatal within a certain period of time. And we were eventually able to figure out who it was. And so it had disappeared. And then in the nineties, there was a similar uh, situation in Chicago. It was in, uh, yeah, it was in the 92, uh, 92, 93, where we had a series of overdoses over one weekend surrounding um, one area of the west side of Chicago. And that, that was controlled by uh, 
uh, one particular street gang, the Gangster Disciples. And I think in a two day period, 26 people overdosed and 11 of them died. So we started getting on them and we listened to their phones and lo and behold, one of, one, one of their members, believe it or not, um, made a phone call uh, to a location in Mexico, which turned out to be the lab. Um, so we were able to get with the Mexicans and within a matter of weeks, we shut down that whole thing. And of course, the public forgot about it very quickly, but I can tell you that sent shockwaves through everybody because anybody that understood what fentanyl could do, specifically if it could be produced, um, what it could do to the heroin and opiate problem that we were already experiencing was really was awful. Um, so Chapo, believe it or not, and others like him, saw the opioid issue in the United States based off prescription drug abuse. And so they kind of slowed down the importation of cocaine and they ramped up the production of poppy leading to heroin and the Colombians obviously were, were involved in heroin. So they began putting high potency cheap heroin on the street, knowing full well that many of the people that were addicted to prescription drugs couldn't get them, it was too expensive. Yeah. Uh, and they would turn because it was an opioid and they would turn to it. And, and so we saw an explosion specifically. I was a boss in Chicago at the time, and it was not just the inner city. It was every social economic uh, group you could think of from uh, a couple of undercover tapes I should send you where they showed up. Social media said, hey, we're going to be on the corner or walk and don't walk at seven o'clock. Guys in pilot uniform for United showed up, nurses. Uh, rich housewives would drive in. It was unbelievable. Um, and that was all Chapo's doing. And that was when he was producing heroin. And then shortly after that, we began to see heroin laced with fentanyl. Um, and now we're seeing fentanyl laced with heroin. That's how far it's come. Yeah, um, I I, uh, I don't remember the name of the book, but I read a fascinating book. And it basically talked about how the crackdown on the overprescription of opioids led to I believe it was black tar heroin, and they'd keep it in their mouth. The dealers would keep it in their mouth, but they would literally go and park their cars at the pill mills that people were now getting uh, pushed yeah. away from because the doctors, the, the pendulum was swinging in the other direction. And they, so they're just dealing black tar heroin in the parking lot of pharmacies. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, and that's a big problem because if you look at what that evolved in, black tar heroin is was usually constricted to a small user base because it's very hard to use. It primarily comes out of the Durango region of Mexico, uh, transported by several different families uh, over 50 years, but it exploded because of its opioid addiction. Um, so now when you have people like Guzman coming up with cheap, potent heroin, they weren't using needles to ingest it. They were smoking and snorting it just like cocaine. So you gone were the fears of AIDS or hepatitis using a needle. So you had this completely different user base on down to high school kids in the suburbs who were beginning to experiment with it. Um, and it exploded. It really exploded. And, and, you know, at the time, I was very concerned, obviously, for our agents and law enforcement in general. I can't tell you how many police chiefs, uh, when I was a deputy, called um, because they had canine dogs that had had expired yeah because they searched a car and you know the guy you know like the movies the guy would sniff it and you know, boom down goes he and then the dog's down so it was a completely different change thing for law enforcement how are we going to deal with it how would we test it and then obviously you know the whole issue with with the addiction and the, and the over uh overdose deaths it's it still hasn't subsided i think it's worse and quite frankly our relationship with china isn't making it better because that's where the chemicals come from. And they're now going directly into Mexico. I was going to ask um, you that. How, how are these cartels producing so much fentanyl? And, and actually, I guess for a relative uh, an understanding for people, the size and scale of how, how little is needed, a kilo of fentanyl is enough to kill a half a million people, which is yeah. insane to me. It's the average size of a book, let's say half yeah. a million people potentially fatal. How are they making something that potent? 
Well, they're getting they're getting the primary precursor chemicals mostly from China, uh, but some other Asian countries. In, in China, in particular, the the chemical industry is so deregulated um, that you can you can turn your garage into something that's producing a precursor. Uh, so organized crime in China and Asia is now hooked up with organized crime in Mexico. And uh, it, it, bulk quantities now are going directly into Mexico. So they're producing the fentanyl 24 seven, you know, it, it's 40 to 50 times stronger than street level heroin. You don't have to worry about the rain or the sun or the soil to nurture it. Um, it is the worst I've ever seen. And in terms of revenue stream for the cartels, they've never had it so good. Yeah, I live in northwestern Montana, 60 miles from the Canadian border, and have a lot of close friends who work in law enforcement, and there are Narcan boxes yeah. all over their vehicles, and they, uh, the source for the fentanyl here uh, in northwestern Montana, even though we're 60 miles from the Canadian border, is still up Mexico, up the coast, and then it comes inward through a few different source cities, but it's even as far away from the Mexican border, not as far, I guess we could be 10 miles from the Canadian border, but still up there, the town up there, I'm sure is dealing with the same issues. Yeah, it, it really is. And I, I, I think the I think the hard part for people to understand is it touches everybody. I think if you if you were really honest, every community has been hit by it hard. Um, and, you know, what is it we're going to do about it? I fought for a long period of time uh, in front of Congress uh, to make the cartels, to designate them as terrorist-related organizations, because that's what they are. What and, would that change you know, if, if the U.S. was able to do that, or if we did do that? What would that change in the fight against them? Um, first of all, it would give us legal authority to do some things that we can't do now. Second of all, we could sanction the companies that are involved in laundering their money much easier than we can now. Uh, and it would provide a tremendous amount of money for training and resources to the Mexicans. And that's one of the things that uh, we found so successful in Colombia is when we really went in in a multi-nation effort to train and work alongside um, with the Colombian police. Uh, it made a tremendous difference in their military. Uh, and we have not been able to do that in Mexico, uh, probably because the military is so splintered in terms of... Uh, who you can trust and who you can't trust. There really is no, this is an important thing. And I, it's funny, but my wife always brings it up. I get calls around spring break from every parent I know who's got a kid that's in school that wants to go to Mexico. And, and I always say, well, you know, could you just go to Florida, go to the Bahamas, just stay out of there. Um, there really is no local or state police apparatus that's consistent throughout Mexico. And that's really part of the problem. Um, so they rely on the military and they rely on the federal police with all the inherent issues that they've had over the years. It is a tough one. So I think designating them terrorist related organizations would allow for the influx of our abilities, uh, certainly some surveillance capabilities that we, we can get now, but they're very difficult and costly. And they have to be diverted from other areas. Um, it would really make a difference. I also think the thing it would do, it would scare the hell out of legitimate Mexican businesses, many of which uh, make millions and millions and are based to some extent along the border and even internally in the United States. Um, it would it would really make a difference. I don't know, you know, every all these politicians. I, I'm telling you, the last two years on the job were the worst for me because I had to deal with Congress. Um, the relationships that some Congress members have with Big Pharma uh, was a killer. Uh, and their lack of understanding of what we're up against um, was is real. I mean, I, I, I testified one time in front of the House Judiciary Committee in a closed session because we were going to talk about some classified things. And, I, you know, I thought these guys, these, these members of Congress, were briefed about everything and nothing was going to when we went through the presentation and we showed them some of our operations and what we found people just couldn't believe that this happens 
you know, on our border, essentially. Yeah. And the violence and brutality and still nothing is, is come of it. So it's frustrating for me. It really is. Well, if people pay attention, it's readily apparent how little sometimes those that are in elected positions of power have an understanding over what it is they're trying to regulate. I remember when uh, they had Mark Zuckerberg come on and they were talking about Facebook and <sighs> would be the polite way to put this. Some of the people asking him questions didn't even have a baseline understanding of the technology that he was there to speak about, and yet they were in a position to try to regulate or change policy. Yeah, yeah. It's a, t- it's know, a so tenuous position to be in when you don't actually know what you're talking about. It, it, it is. And, and one of the things that I tried to do, and I think we had some success, was I would go to individual congressmen and just talk about their districts. And we would show a chart. Uh, you have a street gang operating in your district. Uh, we dump their phones. Uh, why are they called in Mexico? And then we would show what was going on on the other end of Mexico. And that got their attention because obviously that's their, their constituents. Uh, but in general, they they didn't care about the big picture. Uh, and, and then as you're doing these types of operations, and, and you know this, bad stuff happens. Um, you know, I tell, I used to tell all our young agents, because I'm really an old school guy. We're, you're not going to find another DEA guy like me anymore. They're not there. Um, they're older than me. They brought me through. It's a different agency. But I used to tell our guys, we're risk takers. That's what you're paid to do. And we're going to prepare for the, you know, hopefully the best, but we're, we're going to be ready for the worst. And bad things happen when good people try to do good things sometimes. And unfortunately, when those things happen, that's all Congress focused on. Yeah. Um, and it, it's a shame because it's kind of a sound bite driven uh, situation now um, where good work that's being done around the world, guys risking their life, nobody wants to really hear about. It's, it's disheartening at best. What is the argument that you get in the halls of Congress against declaring these cartels as a terrorist organization? Like, What's the justification to not do that? Um, it's a sovereign nation, and these are, this, this should be handled at the criminal level. And then, so my counter to that would be, have you examined their criminal justice system in Mexico? It's ridiculous. Um, it, their system is, is archaic in the sense that the prosecutor is really the lead investigator. Hmm. So where we would, where a DEA or FBI agent would prepare a case, then take it to a U.S. attorney uh, to prosecute, it's backwards. So consequently, nothing gets done. And you what you find is you find... The cops or the investigators so frustrated um, that nothing seems to get done and doesn't get done in the system. And we've the Department of Justice has spent millions trying to educate them on how they could do this, but that's been a bust. Um, but it's it's pretty it's pretty much there along our border. We sell we share billions of legitimate commerce. And we're going to say they're a terrorist organization. And my my thing to that is we did the same thing with Al-Qaeda, with the FARC, uh, with Hamas. They reside within an area that we have respect for and relations, but they're an entity that needs to be surgically taken out. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's like it, cancer. You could, adri- you could address it from the perspective of removing the dangerous and insidious portions, but you're trying to allow the organism to live and actually thrive without it. Right, right. I mean, and they would say to me, well, you know who this guy is, go get him. Uh, are you from Mars? You just told me that the sovereign <laughs> country, we can't operate there. It's, you know. I wish they would have so, give us, given us those rules of engagement, my old job. Oh, you know where he's at, just oh, go get him. Oh, okay, that's all I need? <laughs> and see, that that would have been, been so great. I would have said, look, I got a guy I know that can go get him. Yeah, no problem. You're sure I'm not okay going to get you? prosecuted. Right, he'll go tonight, and we'll have the guy tomorrow. And I, I think if we did a couple of joint operations with the right segment of the, the military down there, um, with the idea as soon as we capture him, we extradite him, it would send a shockwave through. But I think the publicity surrounding the designation would also hurt them. Uh, it really would hurt them. When we were, I was the boss in Chicago and we did something that, I don't know, I came up with this crazy idea. The Chicago Crime Commission 
has been around since the 1920s. And they were the ones that kept track of all the old uh, Chicago outfit guys, Al Capone. And, and they named Al Capone public enemy number one. And that was a big thing then. Um, so I came up with the idea that the Crime Commission should name Chapo Guzman public enemy number one. It hadn't been done since Al Capone. And they bid on it and they did it. And we held a press conference and there were 200 media outlets there, many of them from overseas. Because all they think about is Chicago, you know, bang, bang, shoot everybody up. But what it did, unbeknownst to me, it, it angered legitimate Mexican-based uh, businesses that were operating in the United States. They were embarrassed. Mm. So consequently, they put heat on their government, many of them being big political donors, uh, and that freed up the Mexican Marines to begin to work closer with DEA, and that led to Chapo. So it worked in that sense. Um, but I do think there's a lot there's a lot of public pressure that could be put on them. And I think we have to separate. You know, one of the things we haven't done well, and I wish we would, we're siloed. When we talk about human smuggling and we talk about narcotic trafficking, they're one in the same and we have to stop looking and developing strategies that attack each or the other mm. because they're the same groups of people. Uh, and I understand budgets. Each agency wants their own budget and their scorecard with Congress. I get it. But we're beyond that now with these people. And I think we need to do a better job of that. It's going to take some real leadership. If you were able to, not that this position exists in the government, but if you were able to get to a place where you could pull whatever levers you wanted to and you had absolute and total control to change how we structure the fight on the border to stop fentanyl from coming across, what would you do? Um, three things, I think. I, I think, number one, I would enlist your help. <laughs> no, I'm sure I, I really mean it. Um, guys with your experience, because we don't know enough five miles into Mexico. Yeah, We should know more. Um, second of all, I think on the legitimate side of the house, I don't understand, and I, I've asked to be explained a thousand times. To me, this is a simple process. You come up with the ability to search everything you can that comes across the border. Technology is there now. We're doing about 30% of what comes across that gets put into secondary. And that's because of personnel and equipment issues. I would look to do that. I would definitely push for some type of terrorist-related designation it may be a completely new legislation compared to what we know exists, molded in and around uh, the cartel activity. And then I would take, in a no-nonsense way, uh, right to the president. Oh, the president of Mexico, by the way, has said publicly that they don't produce fentanyl in Mexico. Hmm. So that's what you're dealing with. Yeah, This is a guy that wanted to make peace with the cartels. But I would take our... our uh, our financial strength and put it right to them and say, you're going to have to do something about this. And then it has to be a consistent fight. It can't go peaks and valleys like the political process. It can't be old news yesterday. It's got to be new news today and tomorrow. And, the, and we can make progress. We did it against organized crime here in the United States. We can do it there. Uh, but we, we're going to have to offend some people. And I, I, I told senators, hey, you know, you want this done? Aggressive policing, aggressive international policing. When we're aggressive, we're going to make mistakes. It's how we handle those mistakes. Um, and what's the after do we learn? Uh, and that like, it just doesn't seem, I think the other issue too is on the downside of it. When I started over 30 years ago, you know, when I drew my gun and said, you know, stop, federal agent, you for the most part, they did what you told them. Yeah. Not now. I need your skills. Our guys need your skills because you could find yourself in a gunfight or worse immediately. Um, so we need, I think we need to instill that in our legislative thought process, which we're not doing very well, uh, not doing well. And then I think we need to seriously look at education and treatment, not you know, you know where the the best treatment programs are found? In no. prison. No. Interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Why can't we why can't we get treatment to people that need it and deserve it and that want it? 
I'm not talking about multiple violent offenders or any of the, but uh, the people that need it. And you find in every community, at every social economic level, there are people that need it. Um, and then I think the other thing we need to do is rewrite, redo, rebribe, whatever we got to do to make it very clear to the Mexicans, if we have a target of interest, we're going to go after him. And we're, he's not stopping in your court. We're not going to go to your local jail. He's going to get put on a DEA or a military plane or helicopter, and he's out. Um, because it's just too layered there, and corruption is, you know, from the street level up to the president's office, quite frankly. Yeah. Mr. Riley, I want to be respectful of your time. What would you like to close out with? I, uh, you know, and I appreciate all, first of all, I appreciate your service and everything you've done. But I, I just, I want to make it clear that on this job, much like your career, I didn't do anything by myself. Um, and I fought as we wrote the book with the editors. That I could not have done any of this or motivated anyone or changed anything without literally thousands of dedicated, brave DEA, FBI, local police, prosecutors, Mexican authorities, uh, European authority. It, it just couldn't do it. And I'm, I'm, I, I am forever, because of my career, um, I am forever in the debt of those guys. And unfortunately, I've had to bury a few. And I, it, as you well know, it, it never goes away. But I am just amazed at the creativity, the bravery, uh, the urgency in which we work. Um, and I want the people to know that there really are, there are DEA agents right now around the world in very dangerous places trying to do the right thing so it doesn't come to your community and your town and your family. And for those guys, I'm so proud of. Uh, for the past agents that brought me up, and for the future agents that are going to carry this job on, we are privileged to have people like that. And I feel so lucky that I was around them. I really do. That's like the best ending ever. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you Thanks. so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Hopefully you enjoyed today's episode. And I hope it hit home for everybody listening, especially those with kids who may be approaching the time where they are curious about experimenting with substances. If you or someone you know is struggling with a fentanyl addiction, please know that there is help out there. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration has a database of treatment organizations around the country. To find providers in your area, you can visit findtreatment.gov. And say that again, findtreatment, all one word, but normal spelling, .gov. Or you can call 1-800-662-HELP, H-E-L-P. Thank you again for listening to Change Agents and Ironclad Original. We are going to be back next week with an all-new episode. I'll see you then. 